Okay, tonight I thought I'd get a couple of more book reviews out of the way. These aren't the ones that I talked about in the uh, load of books that I just, uh, uh, the book haul that I just uh, uploaded, but it is uh, a review of, this one will be a review of a novel, and I'm also going to upload a review of a book of literary essays, literary criticism. But first, the novel. Um, the novel is um, one that I think is doesn't have nearly the audience that that it deserves. It's um, Nightwood by uh, Juna Barnes, and with an introduction by T. S. Eliot. For whatever reason, it seems that Nightwood has one of those more precarious reputations in uh, 19th century literature. Uh, the name of its author, Duna Barnes, is still synonymous with the life of the modern and modernist, with a capital M, American expatriate living in Paris. However, kind of like Lawrence Durrell, another author I've been thinking quite a bit about lately, she seems to have fallen into disfavor. And I think this is quite a loss for people who love fiction. Like Durrell's Alexandria Quartet, each of which I've reviewed in separate videos here, uh, this coheres as fiction in a completely different way from most other fiction. While Durrell's prose is fluid and sometimes downright meretricious, Barnes uses her characters, especially the eccentric Dr. O'Connor that we meet in Nightwood, to stretch the limits of language and meaning. O'Connor is a fey dandy and a philosopher mystagogue and is so preposterous and unbelievable it's a miracle that we even think he works as a character but he does he serves as a perennial touching conversational stone um, conversational touching stone um, for all the other characters endlessly and giddily upending their assumptions and especially in the case of another character Nora her emotional commitments. The other character, characters, each histrionic in their own way, are all fairly normal in comparison. The plot is bare bones and pretty simple. The Baron, who is a self-stylized aristocrat monk, uh, shares, uh, excuse me, meets and marries Robin Boat, who seems lost and discontented, discontented whoever she surrounds herself with and wherever she goes, often being driven to roam the streets of the city at night, uh, becoming a listless flaneur. The chapter entitled Watchmen What of the Night is one of the most beautiful meditations on night and especially a walking around at night that I've ever read in literature. Soon after having a child with a baron, she leaves him and moves in with a woman named Nora, with whom she is just as spiritually out of place as she was with the Baron. Uh, Robin then finally leaves Nora for a woman named Jenny, at which point Nora turns to Dr. O'Connor for solace. His brand of consolation is really some peculiar posy, uh, to say the least. Uh, at the height of Nora's despair, her heart rent in two by a woman she truly loved. And it's quite clear in the novel that this is more than just platonic love. Dr. O'Connor offers these comforting words, if you would be comforted by them. He says, For the thickness of the sleep that is on the sleeper we forgive as we forgive the dead for the account of the earth that lies upon them. What we do not see, we are told, we do not mourn. Yet night and sleep trouble us, suspicion being the strongest dream, and dread the throng. The heart of the jealous knows the best and the most satisfying love, that of the other's bed, where the rival perfects the lover's imperfections. Fancy gallops to take part in that duel, unconstrained by any certain articulation of the laws of that unseen game. 
How would you like someone telling you that when the person that you're madly in love with has just run off with another woman? Uh, like I said, he's a, he's a pretty odd character. And in the whole arc of the novel, Dr. O'Connor, who just spoke those words, is probably the most amazing creation. All throughout the novel you see these, or read these perorations of O'Connor. Everyone runs into him for whatever reason and um, in different circumstances and that's how he always talks. <laughs> he's, he's just wonderful and weird and wacky and completely unbelievable and believable at the same time. What more can I say? T.S. Eliot wrote a really beautiful introduction to the book that does two things I think introductions rarely do. And that is, he holds back any plot spoilers. Uh, I apologize, I probably should, should have said that at the beginning. Um, this review contains plot spoilers. Um, not that there's really anything to give away. I mean, this, this is not about finding out what happens really to the characters. It's all about encountering a literary experience which is unique unto itself. And the second thing he does in his introduction is to actually shed light on the text in some meaningful way without giving away those plot spoilers. It can safely be read as I read it uh, before finishing the book. And I second Eliot's take on the novel, especially his observation, uh, that in Nightwood you will find, quote, great achievement of a style, the beauty of phrasing, the brilliance of wit and characterization, and a quality of horror and doom very nearly related to that of Elizabethan tragedy. End quote. The brilliance and wit characterization is something I can only second and treble. This is really beautiful, high, bold modernism at its most audacious, and the sum of its effects effects is simply stunning, I thought. So if you're into something, especially modernism, that's very experimental, it's very short, it's not a big time investment, but my goodness, it's certainly beautiful. Nightwood by Juna Barnes. <laughs>